Chapter 20 Guest of Honor I am going to die. Rowan had begun repeating this to himself like a mantra, hoping it would make it easier to digest. Yet, he seemed no closer to accepting it. Even under different scythes, the edict pronounced that Conclave still stood. He would kill Saitra at the end of their apprenticeship, or she would kill him. It was too juicy a bit of drama for the scythes to cancel just because they were no longer apprentices of Scythe Farthey. No one knew he could not kill Saitra, and the only way to avoid the possibility would be to throw the competition, to perform so poorly between now and the final conclave that they had no choice but to grant Scythehood to Saitra. Then, her first honor-bound duty would be to glean Rowan. He trusted she would make it quick, and that she would be merciful. The trick would be n to not make his failure obvious. He must appear to be doing his best. No one must know his true plan. He was up to the task. I am going to die. Before that fateful day, in the principal's office with Cole Whitlock, Rowan hadn't even known anyone who died. Gleaning had always been at least three degrees removed. The relative of someone who knew someone who knew. But over the past four months, he'd witnessed dozens upon dozens of Gleaning's firsthand. I am going to die. Eight more months, he would see his seventeenth birthday, but not much more. Even though it would be his choice, the thought of being just another statistic for the site's records infuriated him. His life had been a whole lot of nothing. Let you skit. He had thought the label was funny, a badge of honor, but now it was an indictment. His was life without substance, and now it would end. He should never have accepted Said Farday's invitation to be a Said's apprentice. He should have just gone on with his unremarkable life, because then, maybe, yes maybe, he might have had the chance to do something remarkable with it in time. <clears throat> you've barely said a word since you've got into the car. I'll tell when I have something to say. He rode with Scythe Volta in an off-grid Rolls Royce, perfectly maintained since the Age of Mortality. The Scythe's yellow robe, in stark contrast to the dark earth tones of the vehicle interior. Volta didn't do the driving. There was a chauffeur. They walked through a neighborhood where the homes became increasingly larger and the grounds more vast, until the residences disappeared entirely behind gates and ivy covered walls. Volta one of Goddard's disciples had golden citrine gems embedded in his yellow robe. He was clearly a junior scythe, just a few years out of apprenticeship, in his early twenties, perhaps, a still an age where numbering one's years felt important. His features and skin tone had an Afric leaning, which made the yellow of his garment seem even brighter. So, is there a reason why you chose your robes to be the color of peace? Bolda laughed. <laughs> I think you'll fit in just fine. Seth Connor likes those close to him to be as sharp as his blades. Why do you follow him? The honest question seemed to bother him more than the urinary barb. Bolda became the tiniest bit defensive. Mm, Seth Goddard is visionary. He sees our future. I'm much more interested in being a part of the Seth Dome's future than its past. Rowan turned back to the window. The day was bright, but the th tinted windows dimmed it, as if they were in the midst of a partial eclipse. Juggling people by the hundreds, is that the future you mean? We have the same quota as all the other sites, was all Volta said on the matter. Rowan turned back to look at Volta, who now seemed to have trouble keeping eye contact. Who did you train under? Rowan asked. Scythe Nero? Rowan seemed to recall Scythe Farthey chatting with Scythe Nero during Conclave. They appear to be on good terms. How does he feel about you hanging around with Goddard? Mm, to you, he is Honorable Scythe Goddard, Bolda said, a bit indignant. And I couldn't care less how Scythe Nero feels, so guard sides have obsolete ideas. They're too set in their ways to see the wisdom of the change. He spoke of the change as if it were a tangible thing. A thing that, by its very weight, could make a person strong simply by pushing it. They stopped at a pair of rough iron gates, 
which slowly soon opened to admit them. Here we are, said Volta. A quarter mile driveway ended at the palatial estate. A servant greeted them and led them into the mansion. Rowan was immediately assaulted by loud dance music. There were people everywhere, reveling as if it were New Year's Eve. The whole state seemed to undulate in the throes of the relentless beat. People laughing, drinking, and laughing some more. Some of the guests were sides, and not just goders of his disciples, other sides as well. There were also some minor celebrities. The rest seemed to be beautiful people who were probably professional party guests. His friend Tiger aspired to be one of those. A lot of kids said that, but Tiger really meant it. The servant led them out back to a huge pool that seemed more suited to a resort than a home. There were waterfalls and a swim-up bar, and more beautiful people happily bobbing. Scythe Goddard was in a cabana beyond the deep end, yet front open to the festivities before him. He was attended by more than one fawning bimbo tech. He wore his signature royal blue robe, but as Rowan got closer, he could see it was a silver variation than the one he had worn at Conclave. His leisure robe. Rowan wondered if the man had a diamond studded bathing suit in his wardrobe as well. <laughs> Rowan Damisk, said Seth Goddard as they approached it. He took a servant passing with a tray of drinks to give Rowan a glass of champagne. When Rowan didn't take it, Seth Bolter grabbed one and put it in Rowan's hand before disappearing into the trunk, leaving Rowan to fend for himself. Please, enjoy, said Goddard. I serve only Don Perignon. Rowan took a sip, wondering if an underage side's apprentice could get market down for drinking. Then he remembered that such rules didn't apply to him anymore, so he took another sip. Now you arrange this little bacchanal in your honor, the side said, gesturing to the party around them. What do you mean, in my honor? Exactly that. This is your party. Do you like it? The surreal display of excess was even more intoxicating than the champagne, but did he like it? Mostly he just fell weird, and weirder still to know that he was the guest of honor. I don't know, I've never had a party before, Rowan told him. It was true. His parents had seen to so many birthdays by the time Rowan was born, they had stopped celebrating them. He was lucky if they even remembered to get him a gift. Well then, said Seth Goddard. Let this be the first of many. Rowan had to remind himself that this man with the perfect smile, secreting charisma instead of sweat, was the man who had manipulated him and sighted into mortal competition. But it was her not to be dazzled by his style, and as distasteful as it all this spectacle was, it still made his adrenaline flow. The scythe patted the seat beside him for Rowan to sit, and Rowan took his place at the scythe's right hand, doesn't the Eighth Commandment say that a scythe can own anything but his rope, ring, and journal? Correct, said Scythe Goddard brightly, and I own none of this. The food is donated by generous benefactors. The guests are here by choice, and this fine estate has been graciously loaned to me for as long as I choose to grace its calls. Upon the mention of the state, a man cleaning the pool looked up at them for a moment before returning to his labors. You should reread the commandments, Scythe Goddard said. You'll find that nothing in them demands that Scythe send the creature can force that make life worth living. That bleak interpretation by old guard Scythe is a relic from another time. Rowan did not offer any further opinion on the subject. It was Scythe Faraday's humble and serious old guard nature that had made an impression on Rowan. Had he been approached by Scythe Goddard with enticement of rock star glamour in exchange for the taking of lives, he would have declined. But Faraday was dead, and Rowan was here, looking out on strangers that were here for his benefit. If it's my party, so then I have people I know? A Scythe is a friend to the world. Open your arms and brace it. It seemed Scythe Goddard had an answer for everything. Your life is about to change, Rowan Damisk, he said, waving his arm to indicate the pool and the partiers and the servants and the elaborate spread of food just past the sallow end that kept being replenished. In fact, it already has. Among the party guests was a girl who seemed markedly out of place. 
She was young, nine or ten at the most, and completely oblivious to the party around her as she frolicked in the sallow end of the pool. It looks like one of your guests brought their kid to the party, Rowan commented. That, said Goddard, is Esma, and you would be wise to treat her well. She's the most important person you will meet today. How so? That chubby little girl is the key to the future, so you'd better hope she likes you. No one would have continued picking at Goddard's enigmatic responses, but his attention was grabbed by a beautiful party girl approaching in a bikini that seemed almost painted on. Rowan realized, a moment too late, that he was stirring. She grinned and he blushed, looking away. Ariane, would you be so kind as to give my apprentice a message? Yes, your honor, said the girl. Uh, maybe later, Rowan said. Nonsense, said the scythe. You need to loosen up, and Ariane has magical hands skilled in Swedish technique. Your body will thank you, she took Rowan by the hand, and that killed any resistance. He rose and let himself be led away. If our young man is pleased by your efforts, scythe Goddard called after them. I will allow you to kiss my ring. As Arian led him to the massage tent, Rowan thought, In eight months I am going to die, so perhaps he could allow himself a little indulgence on the way. I am disturbed by those who revere us far more than those who disdain us. Too many put us on a pedestal, too many long to be one of us, and knowing that they can never be makes their longing even greater. For all sides are apprenticed in their youth. It is either naive void in thinking that we are somehow of a higher order of being, or it is the product of that depraved heart. For who but the depraved would revel in the taking of life? For a time years ago, there were groups who would emulate and imitate us. They would fashion robes like those of sides. They would wear rings that looked si similar to ours. For many it was just costume play, but some would actually pretend to be sides, fooling others, granting false immunity, everything sort of clink. There are laws against impersonating workers in any profession, but no law preventing anyone from impersonating a scythe. Since the Thunderhead has no jurisdiction over the scythe dome, it cannot pass any laws concerning us. It was an unforeseen glitch in the separation of scythe and state. However, it wasn't a glitch for long. In the year of the Stingray, at the 63rd World Conclave, it was decided that all such imposters shall be cleaned on sight, publicly and most violently. While one might expect such an edict to produce a bloodbath, very few cleanings ever took place. Once word got out, the posers set their false robes and vanished into the woodwork of the world. To this day, the edict remains, but rarely needs to be invoked, because few are foolish enough to impersonate a scythe, and yet now and again, I hear at Conclave the rare tale of a scythe coming face to face with an imposter and having to clean them. Usually, the conversation is about the inconvenience of it, how the scythe must then track down the imposter's family to grant immunity and such, but I wonder more about the imposter. What was it they hoped to achieve? Was it the lure of the forbidden? Were they enticed by the danger of being caught? Or did they simply wish to live this life so badly that they chose one of the few direct paths to annihilation? From the Gleaning Journal of Honorable Scythe Curry. Chapter 21 Branded The party continued for another day, festival of success on all levels. Rowan joined in the revelry, but it was more out of obligation than anything. He was the center of attention, the celebrity of the moment. In the pool, beautiful people bobbed toward him. At the buffet, guests cleared the way so he could always be at the front of the line. It was awkward, yet heady. He couldn't deny that there was a part of him that enjoyed the surreal nature of celebratory attention. The lettuce elevated to a place of honor. It was only when the other sides in attendance shook his hand and wish him luck in his mortal competition against Saitra, that he sobered and remembered what was at stake. He borrowed brief snippets of sleep in the cabana, always awakened by music, or raucous laughter, 
or fireworks. Then, late in the afternoon of the second day, when Scythe Goddard had enough, he merely whispered so, and word spread quickly. In less than an hour, the guests had left, and servants began to clean the detritus of revelry from the usually silent grounds. Now, only the other residents of the state remained, Scythe Goddard, his three junior sides, the servants, and the girl, Esme, who peered out of her bedroom window at Rowan like a wraith, as he sat in Goddard's cabana, awaiting whatever came next. Scythe Bolt approached, his yellow robes rippling in the breeze. What are you still doing out here? he asked. I have nowhere else to be, Rowan told him. Come with me, Bolt said. It's time to begin your training. There was a wine cellar in the basement of the main house. Hundreds, perhaps thousands of bottles of wine rested in brick alcoves. A bare minimum of bulbs laid the space, casting long shadows and making the alcoves seem like portals to indisclosed hells. Said Bolta led Rowan to the central chamber of the cellar, where Goddard and the other sides waited. Said Rand produced a device from her green robe. It looked like a cross between a gun and a flashlight. Do you know what this is? she asked. It's a tweaker, Rowan told her. He'd had the occasion several years ago to have his nanites tweak when his teachers decided his moodiness had crossed the line into depression. That was five or six years ago. The tweaking was painless and the effect subtle. He hadn't noticed much of a change, but everyone agreed that he had begun to smile more. Arms out, legs spread, said Scythe Rand. Rowan did as he was told, and Scythe Rand passed the tweaker all over his body like some sort of magical wand. Rowan felt a mild tingling in his extremities that quickly faded. She stepped back, and Scythe Goddard approached. Have you ever heard the expression being made? asked Scythe Goddard, or being jumped in? Rowan shook his head noticing that the other sides had positioned themselves around him, leaving Rowan at the center of their circle. Well, you're about to find out what it means. The other sides then removed their cumbersome outer robes. Now, down to their tunics and knickers, they took aggressive stances. There was a look of determination on each of their faces, and maybe a little bit of Jewish anticipation. Rowan knew what was about to happen an instant before it began. Seth Chomsky, the largest of them, stepped forward and, without warning, swung his fist. Connecting with Rowan's cheek so hard, he spun around, lost his footing and fell to the dusty floor. Rowan felt the shock of the punch, the jagged bolt of pain, and waited for the telltale warmth of his nanites releasing pain-killing opiates into his, into his bloodstream. But the relief didn't come. Instead, the pain swelled. It was horrible, overwhelming. Rowan had never experienced such pain. He never knew such pain could even exist. What did you do? He wailed. What did you do to me? We turned off your nanites, Saith Bolta said calmly, so you could experience what our ancestors once did. There's a very old expression, Saith Goddard told him. To be painless is to be gainless, he gripped Rowan warmly on the shoulder, and I wish you to gain much. Then he stood back, signaled the others to advance, and they began to beat Rowan to a pulp. Recovery without the aid of healing nanites was a slow, miserable process that seemed to get worse before it got better. The first day, Rowan longed to die. The second day, he thought he actually might. His head pounded. His thoughts swam. He slipped in and out of consciousness with little warning. It was hard to breathe, and he knew he had several broken ribs. And although Scythe Chomsky had painfully popped his dislocated shoulder back into place at the end of his beating, it still ached with each heartbeat. Scythe Volta visited him several times a day. He sat with Rowan, spoon feeding him soup, and blotting where it spilled from his split, swollen lips. There seemed to be a halo around him, but Rowan knew it was just optical damage that caused the effect. He wouldn't be surprised if he had detached retinas. It burns, he told Bolt as the salty soup spilled over his lips. It does for now, 
Volder told him with genuine compassion. But it will pass and you'll be better for it. How could I be better for any of this? He asked, horrified at how distorted and liquid his words sounded, as if he were speaking through the blow wall of a whale. Volta fed him another spoonful of soup. Six months from now, you tell me if I was right. He thanked Volta for taking the time to visit him when no one else did. You can call me Alessandro, Volta said. Is that your real name? Rowan asked. No, idiot, it's Volta's first name. Rowan supposed that's as close as anyone got to knowing anyone else in the siphon. Thank you, Alessandro. On the evening of the second day, the girl, the one who Godard said was so important, came into his room in between deliriums. What was her name again? Amy? Amy? Oh yes, Esme. I hate that they did this to you, she said with tears in her eyes. But you'll get better. Of course he'd get better. He didn't have any choice in the matter. In mortal days, one died or recovered. Now, there was only one option. Why are you here? To see how you're getting on, she said. No, I mean here, in this place. She hesitated before she spoke. Then she looked away. Seth Goddard and his friends came to a mall near where I lived. They cleaned everyone in the food court except for me. Then he told me to come with him, so I did. It didn't explain anything, but it was the only explanation she offered. Perhaps the only one, you know. From what Rowan could see, this girl served no discernible function at the state. Yet, Goddard gave orders that anyone who ran a fool of her would be severely disciplined. She was not to be bothered in any way, and was allowed free run of the state. She was the biggest mystery he'd encountered yet inside Goddard's world. I think you'll be a better side than the others, she told him, but gave no explanation as to why she thought so. Perhaps it was a gut feeling, but she couldn't be more wrong. I won't be a scythe, he told her. She was the first person he confessed it to. You will, if you want to, she said, and I think you'll want to. Then she left him to ponder the pain and the possibility. Seth Goddard didn't show his face in Rowan's room until day three. How are you feeling? he asked. Rowan wanted to spit at him, but knew it would hurt too much and might even bring about a second beating. How do you think I'm feeling? Rowan answered. He sat on the edge of the bed and studied Rowan's face. Come see yourself. Then he helped Rowan out of the bed, and Rowan hobbled to an ornate wardrobe on which was a full-length mirror. Rowan barely recognized himself. His face was so swollen, it was pumpkin-like, purple bruises all over his face, and body were mottling to all sides of the spectrum. Here is where your life begins, Goddard told him. What you see is the boy dying, the man will emerge. That's such a load of crap, Rowan said, not even caring what response it might evoke. Goddard merely raised an eyebrow. Perhaps, but you can deny this is a turning point into your life. And every turning point must be marked by an event, one that burns itself into you as indelibly as a brand. So now, he was branded. Yet, he suspected this was just the beginning of a much larger trial by fire. The world longs to be like us, Goddard told Rowan, taking and doing what we choose, with neither consequence nor remorse. They would steal our robes and wear them. If they could, you have been given an opportunity to become greater than royalty, so at the very least it requires this rite of passage that I have provided for you. Goddard stood there, studying Rowan a few moments more, then he pulled out the tweaker from his robes. Arms up, legs spread. Rowan took as deep a breath as he could, and did as he was told. Goddard wanted him. Rowan felt tingling his extremities, but when it was done, he didn't feel the warmth of the pH or the deadening of his pain. It still hurts, Rowan told him. Of course it does. I didn't activate your painkillers, just your healing nanites. You'll be good as new by morning and ready to begin your training. But from this moment on, you'll feel every measure of your body's pain. Why? Rowan dared to ask. What person in their right mind would want to feel that kind of pain? Right-mindedness is overrated, Goddard said. I'd rather have a mind that's clear than one that's right. 
In the business of death, which scythes have no competition, unless, of course, you consider fire. Fire kills just as swiftly and completely as a scythe's blade. It's frightening, but also somehow comforting to know that there's one thing the Thunderhead can fix. One type of damage that revival centers are powerless to undo. Once one's goose is cooked, it is truly and permanently cooked. Death by fire is the only natural death left. It almost never happens, though. The Thunderhead monitors heat on every inch of the planet, and the fighting of fires often begins before one can even smell smoke. There are safety systems in every home and every office building, with multiple levels of redundancy, just in case. The more extreme tone cults try to burn the deadies to make it permanent, but ambu drones usually get to them first. Isn't it good to know that we are all safe from the threat of the inferno? Except, of course, when we are not. From the Gleaning Journal of Conor Scythe Scythe